Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. This is video number seven in our series about IC packaging. Today we're going to be talking about system and package, or SIP for short. Um, my name is Alonso, thanks for joining me today. And without further ado, uh, we'll, we'll get started with the video. So SIP is uh, very interesting and the origin dates to the early 2000s. In January of 2000, there was a, a session, the first ever session on system and package, where it was proposed that the term remain system and package. There were other terms proposed before that, but this is the first time that the term really stuck. And uh, it's they, they have this idea of integrating under a common substrate different types of functionality, different types of chips. Uh, before that, also in the year 2000, there had been some research done on on embedded passive components and, uh, and this was known as IPD or integrated passive devices and and really this helped pave the way for some of the things that SIP would do later on with integrating active and passive devices under the same substrate. We also had some prior technology like MCMs or uh, multi-chip modules and SOCs or system on chips which started uh, multifunctionality uh, as an idea. MCMs uh, got a common substrate and they try to put different chips together, uh, which is something similar to what SIP will do later on. And System on Chip tried to add multifunctionality onto a single die by, uh, by having the lithography uh, give different functionality to this same die. There were also different... Uh, technologies developed like Moshi or modular chips and these were like Lego blocks for chips where each of the individual blocks would be optimized for its function and then it focused on creating on creating a, a common interface that would bring all these optimized chips together and FLC was final level cache which was a type of memory architecture that it would use one eighth of the DRAM and consume one fourth of the power while keeping the performance. So all of these things um, started coming together and, and paved the way for what SIP would later on be. So why why did SIP come along? Why did we need SIP? Well, the first reason, as it usually happens with advanced packaging, is a need for miniaturization. Um, we have Moore's Law, where we're looking for more transistors, smaller, smaller transistors and more transistors in a small area. Um, and SIP helped with this because the chips could really be st um, stuck closer together thanks to the use of a common substrate. You no longer needed PCP tracks or, or anything like that. You could just have the chips basically next to each other and it would increase the density in that aspect. And uh, this miniaturization was really useful for handheld or wearable devices. An example here would be a smartwatch where you really don't have a lot of space, but you need to include a lot of functionality. Now, another key driver was the need for DRAM and logic integration. And this is what, what you would know or as more than more. It doesn't only focus on the number of transistors, but rather in the number of different functionality that you can have in one single chip. And System on Chip already started experimenting with this, but it wasn't optimized really that well. So having individual chips really helped in the performance aspect. Another type of integration was digital and RF integration. So having analog components, uh, radio components really helped with things like 5G or in the future, maybe 6G um, communications. And again, system of chip was not really fit for this because it wasn't cost or performance efficient to do everything under the same die. So by partitioning and uh, having it done in different optimized chips, this really helped the performance of the chip. And this is where SAP really stood out. So what what is really system and package? Because uh, the term is thrown around a lot. And the truth is that there isn't really one set definition. It's more of like a flexible definition. And this is our interpretation on it. Uh, but the key, the key idea is that you have a group of ICs that are mounted onto a common substrate. Um, and then it usually, for the most part, has some heterogeneous integration. Uh, and like we said before, this is known as more than more, where you would have a, some kind of multifunctionality. So you would have different chips doing different things, 
all working under the same substrate. Now, in in recent years, uh, the interposer has really become a must. And when when the SAP started in the early 2000s, the interposer really wasn't a thing. But as the technology developed, SAP really adopted this and made use of the silicon interposer with through silicon vias. And this helped for um, much closer packing of the dyes, um, faster inter shorter interconnections, which led to faster uh, connections and overall better performance. So using a silicon interposer with TSV technology really helped the SAP uh, increase its performance. It also helped with the higher density of interconnections, which brings along a higher bandwidth and again, higher performance. Now the chips used for the SAP are usually bare die flip chips. And, and this is because bare die flip chips weigh less and occupy a bit less space rather than traditionally packaged chips. And while SAP can have some wire bonds, flip chips really, again, bring the performance up one step. And it's usually the, the general approach for the SAP. Um, and then one of the final components that you might find on SAP is some passive components. Uh, like I mentioned, it can integrate active and passive components, some RF components or capacitors, inductors, resistors. And some of these can also be embedded in the substrate. Like we said earlier with IPD, some of these passive components will be embedded in the substrate and it all works together um, to form the SIP. Again, this is somewhat flexible. Some of these things you might not be in a, in a specific SIP chip, but all of these components can be part of an SIP. And this is a little bit what you should expect. So what are, what are some of the applications for SIP? Uh, one of the big things is that the technology from SAP was used for 2.5D and 3D packaging. Now, these technologies are a little bit different from each other, and as they all advanced, they started feeding off of each other. So, for example, 2.5D focused on the use of the silicon interposer. And then that silicon interposer technology was also used for SIP. And, and as the technology advances, they feed off each other and they become more powerful and they, they improve a little bit. So 2.5D will focus more on, on the use of the interposer. 3D focuses on density and uh, building vertically. And SAP will focus more on the uh, integration of different chips, on creating a single common interface for all of these to work together. Now, there is a high demand of SAP in small devices. And, and this is really in the fields of uh, wearable devices or health. Uh, this is very interesting. One of the... One of the highlights would be Apple Watch, which uses an SAP chip uh, for all of its series. Uh, it's also used for handheld devices, mobile phones, tablets. It's also used for the automotive industry, uh, especially when it comes to, to automatic cars or self-driving cars. Uh, they need to check in a lot of sensors. They need to check cameras and compute all the information. And uh, having a, a small space was really helpful. Uh, for these chips and also because 3D chips and SAPs had to already deal with issues regarding heating cars are a very hot environment so they use some of the the work that SAP had already done to work in that hot environment created by the car SAPs are also used for internet of things and helping keep everything connected and they've also been used for uh, some applications like artificial intelligence so again, like I mentioned, the definition of the flip of the SIP is a little, a little flexible. But uh, what are the some of the things that you should expect, or that you you can expect to find inside an SIP? Well, like I said, one of the key aspects of the SIP is that it has some um, heterogeneous integration, and this comes with integration of memory and logic mainly. So you should be able to find some chiplets or ICs. And again, these are usually bare flip chips and, and each chip is individually optimized for performance. Uh, bare dies weigh less and they're then fully packaged dies. So you'll find those usually on your SIP and they'll be integrated with some DRAM memory. And this DRAM memory is optimized um, individually before put onto the SIP. And then uh, the interface will be made so that the DRAM can really function to the highest uh, 
to the highest degree. Now, integrating memory and logic in a single die can be really expensive for the case of SOC or system chip. So SAP really allows for cheaper and more optimal integration of, of the memory. And, and that's really a great thing moving into the future. Another thing you should expect is embedded passive devices. So like I said, there's an integration between digital and RF components in, in the same chip. And this usually can be can be difficult, but because these chips are, again, optimized individually, it becomes a lot easier and, and really they can perform a lot better. So this allows for some high Q or high quality passive components to be working at its max capacity, like uh, inductors, resonators, filters. Um, they can also integrate some thin film passive components and uh, and overall these these aspects of the analog uh, components have a much higher performance than SOC um, or some other technologies that came before SIP. In terms of the interconnections, uh, how do they usually work on the SIP? Well, like we said, flip chips are usually the way to go. And just for a quick overview, flip chips, what they do is they'll flip the die upside down and then they pour a molding component over it. But then the front side of the of the chip is exposed. And then they use some solder bumps to connect the front side of the chip directly to the substrate. So this shortens the interconnections and, um, and makes them more efficient, also allows for a, a higher number of interconnections. And then the common substrate, like we've been saying, it'll usually be an interposer layer. And these layers are usually made of silicon and they use uh, TSVs or through silicon vias. And the through silicon vias would be these lines over here that connect the front side and the back side um, and connect, you know, they move all the information from, from the chips to the inputs and outputs. Uh, we'll also have a redistribution layer which will connect the chips among themselves, but also reroute all the connections needed uh, to the right pin. And we'll have the underbump metallization, which uh, will be th the point of connection between the solder bumps from the flip chips to the redistribution layer on the, on the silicon interposer. Now, both of these technologies really help shorten the interconnections and, uh, and add more density of interconnections than previous technologies. So they help a lot with the performance, they increase the bandwidth, they reduce the latency, and overall just increased performance. Some other technologies like bridge technologies, uh, like something similar to Intel's EMIB, have been uh, tested and they could potentially in the future really increase the power of, of SIPs. But as of now, Interposer seems to be the way to go. And uh, you know, the bridges would come along as a, the race between uh, Intel and TSMC, for example, for the transistor size is close to its limit. So now they're really focusing on how to make better interconnections, higher density of interconnections. So this is where the bridges could, could potentially come in in the near future and they could take the power of SIPs to a new level. So how does the supply chain model work for SIPs? Um, the basics is that foundries are mainly in control. And obviously, Fabless can help with the design input. Uh, you know, they're they're the ones who ask for the chip in the first place. So obviously, they'll help with the design, and they'll set some conditions and restraints. But overall, the foundries are the ones that do the heavy lifting, because uh, foundries can produce the individual silicon dies, and they also produce the silicon interposer. And in the, in this aspect, TSMC is leading in uh, SIP with fan-out chips. They'll create their own fan-out chips and then they integrate into their own SAP chips. However, uh, sometimes uh, OSATs can help package uh, at the end of the at the end of the road. So it's mostly in a vertical integration, but sometimes there can be some collaboration between between different companies. An, an example of this would be Apple Watch Series 4, which obviously was uh, designed uh, by Apple or Apple helped design it. The chips were made by TSMC and then uh, they were packaged by ASC, which is a no-set. So one of the things that we looked at here at um, FIX is the, the security for different chips. And um, so how would uh, hardware security work in a chip like the system and package? Uh, well, first of all, there's lots of different components 
So, uh, so an attacker could really try to attack different areas like the interposer, uh, the individual dies, passive components, um, and and they could try to add something like, <clears throat> like an unknown devices, or they could make changes in the photolithography. They could change the recipe or the materials used, and this could potentially cause an issue and like uh, the data could be stolen or lost where they could cause some device failure and it can become even more complicated if you outsource different steps of the process to different companies because um, you it's easy to lose track of where everything is coming from and making sure that everyone is just doing the what they're supposed to be doing however there is an upside to this which is uh, by having uh, the, this partition and having uh, different chips, this also gives you more opportunities for protection and prevention. So you can have something like sensors, firewalls, and, and different areas of your of your chip to to prevent really some of these things from happening. Um, and it gives you more potential ways to monitor the operation. Um, so so you know it's something that the manufacturers should be aware of and should be careful with but there's definitely more opportunities to make sure that the the chip is safe and and secure so looking out to the future how is the sip looking uh well first of all there's a few challenges with sip as with every technology in this case uh, one of them would be a lower yield due to the number of individual dies you know if one of the individual dies fails it could cause failure of the entire chip or just simply like some malfunction and then the chip uh, is the chip is not good. So there is a lower yield due to this. And because integrating all of this can be difficult in, in terms of design and also production, this can really affect the production, the product time to market. However, on the upside, uh, there's some really good opportunities with especially high frequency performance. Like we said, this high Q RF components can really bring some high high performance for high frequency high frequency devices and some of this can be used for communications with 5g or potentially 6g in the future um sip also has a really small form factor which allows for use in miniature devices again uh, some health some medical uh, field devices potentially some like wearables different things like that can really benefit from from the advantages of the sip and again, SAP really provides an all-in-one solution. One single chip can perform the entire system's functionality without the need to really, to really have anything else. So let's do a quick overview of SAP. Um, early in the year 2000s, SAP started coming up. There had been some previous attempts at, uh, or previous developments of multifunctionality in the past, like MCMs or SOC. And then SAP came along and it started uh, doing some heterogeneous integration where they would take chips with different functionalities and connect them under the same substrate. And as the technology started increasing with more integration, uh, the silicon interposer, 2.5D, 3D, the SAP evolved with it. And uh, the use of chiplets, uh, um, uh, wafer level packaging, different things started evolving and SAP evolved with it. And uh, it's a different thing now than it was in the early 2000s. And it really has evolved with the time. But at its core, SAP is still uh, different chips uh, stacked onto a common substrate. These chips are usually different, uh, have different functionality and they will integrate memory and logic. Uh, they will integrate passive components and uh, they will do these things to a common substrate like the like the silicon interposer and thanks to faster interconnections provided by flip chips and uh and the through silicon vs so that's it thank you for watching um uh again i recommend you watch the other videos on on these packaging series if you haven't and uh we'll see you soon with another video so thanks for watching and bye bye